Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to share with you. I'll try to be quick. It's probably the last of the day. You're getting tired and bug-eyed. And I think symposiums are like putting your mouth around a fire hydrant and turning it on. It's like, oh, <laughs> how much can you intake? It's, it's a ton of stuff. And so I have three guiding principles that I design all of my offensive systems around, my defensive systems, all of my techniques, everything I'm going to do. And it's in there in the, in the notes. The first one is simplicity. We play a very complex game, and I'm trying to get, keep it as simple as possible. Not necessarily dumb, but simple so that my athletes can understand what their roles are, what their responsibilities are, so that they can go, OK, this is my job. This is how I need to do. This is what I need to be looking at. And so it's not a complex thing for them to figure out. Science, I want to base things on good information. I don't want to just go, oh, that looks good. See that, and just try it. I want to know why we're doing what we're doing. Is it, maybe it's a motor learning principle. Maybe it's a biomechanic principle. Um, what is the reasons why we're doing something? I spent an enormous amount of time. How do we stand on defense? And so do we stand like this down the line? Do we stand a little bit like this so I can move faster? Do I stand this way so I can dig the ball inside the court? And I was messing around with all different kinds of stuff. And I was talking with one of my mentors. Uh, it was Dr. McGowan. He's going, Ryan, we already did the study. I'm like, OK, what is it? What do you do? How do you stand? He's like, well. We stand like this because it's faster to take a negative step and move forward than it is to just push off. I'm like, well, wow, show me that study. And so those are the kind of things that I want to learn because I want to be able to be as efficient as possible with my systems and teams. Statistics. What is the game telling us? And this is, defense is probably the biggest area where I have tried to study so my systems are based on what is the game showing me? Why am I putting this person here? What's the rationale for it? And so I think it would be arrogant of me to walk into this room and say, hey, these are the systems that you need to do. Put your players here. I found that the game changes based on the levels. What I'm doing with my 14U team, boys team that I did last year and this year is 15U, is different than what I'm doing with my university girls teams. If I'm coaching men's team, it's going to be a little bit different. And there's some principles and questions that I want you to ask. And that's what Dr. McGowan, my mentor, did to me. He said, Ryan, these are the questions you need to ask, and then you have to find answers. So whatever your level is that you're coaching, I want to throw some important questions your way. If you start to answer those questions and figure out what the answer is, I think you'll put a pretty impressive defensive, defensive system together. And so that's my goal. I'm going to be going through some different stuff. And so studies. What to study? A um, couple questions that he gave me to ask. Where do most of the balls go in your league? So that was one of the questions I had to figure out. What is the power level of your game? Okay, so how hard are people hitting the ball? Because there's a two questions that need to answer with that. The first one is, how many blockers are you going to put up? Because I find the harder the level, if you look at men's Olympic level, they're putting three blockers on everything that they can. You look at 14U girls, you don't necessarily need to do that. The same thing goes with um, another components of it. Power equals depth. The harder that people are hitting, the further back in the court you need to start positioning your players because power is going to influ influence something. And so that's a component that needed to get answered. Hitters hit where the ball takes them. How good are we at reading? Okay, so hitters tend, we think, oh, the hitter's going to find that gap and everything's going to get lined up perfectly. So often, and I put myself in practice sometimes and it reminds me, yeah, I've got to hit that ball here because that's where it's been set. So we have to become very good at reading, become very good at adapting and knowing how to and when to do that. And then volleyball, it's a visual motor game. In defense, it's important to practice it. For every ball, if I stood on a box, I would have to hit at 100 balls at an athlete that I feel where if they're getting some live digs, it's way better. Even though they might get 20 digs live, it's way better than 100 balls off of a box. And so that's a component that you have to adjust to. Um, so a couple studies that I had to do. So I, one thing, I live in front of my, my, my computer screen because I watch thousands of hours of video a day. Or not a day, a year. And so I just started looking at attacks. Let's say a left side attack. And what I found is things would happen like this. And even the right side attack, some things were happening, and we did this, there would be some tips, some tips, some tips, some sharp shots, and all of a sudden something became very clear. I don't know if you can see that, but 60% of all attacks started to go through the middle of the court. I'm like, wow, 
this is starting to show something up here. And what I found that correlated with is another study that I just ran across just recently, and I just want to throw that up here for you. I love studies, so if I find them. And this was a coach from Brigham Young University, and uh, he started to put together all attacks in his year. So in one season, he put all these attacks together from every side of the court. And he marked middle, middle here, and then he marked, he had this special app that would be able to sense where the most of the balls are going. And this is what it showed, that that was the major concentration. So that tells me that I'm doing something right. Something's okay with his study and my study. And I did this study at 14U boys, because I wanted to figure it out for my son's game. What was it? I've done it at 14U girls. I've done it at almost most levels. But the same thing correlates. As it gets higher, this starts to push back a little bit. If I was to do university men's, I'm willing to bet that that marker would just be a little bit further back. That's my guess. OK, we know it's symposium. There we go. Now, what they did is they added to that, and they said, OK, all left side attacks. So that was all of his left side attacks for a season. And so what that showed up, if that was middle middle, the majority of it came this way. So we see a huge clump here for tipping, and we start to see a huge clump here where that's people hit. And then he started to break it down by certain players. This was one player, and that was their range as attacker, as an attacker. So we got some here, and we got a little bit everywhere else, but that's still middle middle to me. We got this other player, they've got a little more range. They can hit here, here, and a little bit of tipping. And we've got another player here. They tip a lot. You can see a lot of here. And then we've got some stuff over here. And then this is the player that I want. I don't know who she is or he is. But you can see they tip a lot. They bang inside line a fair bit, what makes it tough. And then they've got this huge range here where they can attack the ball. That's an attacker that I'm looking for. That's going to be a tough attacker to defend. And so with it, though, it still tells me that there's still a lot of majority here. And so that's a study. If you want that study, you just give me an email and I can send it to you. There's some information that goes along with it. I also wanted just to show you other people. So I just decided for the fun of it, I'm going to just pick every team that I've played so far this year and how do they defend the left side ball. And so here's UBC. OK, so this is their defensive formation. We've got someone here. You have to figure out who's responsible for tips. We know that people are going to tip a lot. How are you going to get that ball? So I see UBC's got someone here. They've got a cross court. My guess is these two people would be responsible for some off speed. OK? Let's take a look. Who else do we got here? We've got Saskatchewan. OK, that's how they're defending it. Pretty similar. Pretty similar to what UBC is doing. We've got Alberta. They're, they're a little different. They've committed someone to a tip. So maybe in your league you want to do that. They committed someone. I, my guess is they're putting this person in the seam here to get this seam. And they've got two cross court people. So that's their system. Here's Calgary. Okay, they're a little different too. They commit someone really high here. Guess where we put a lot of ball? Yeah, we rolled and tipped whenever we wanted a point. We didn't use it all the time, but when we wanted one, we knew we could do that. And we got our point. Here's Regina. Very similar to Alberta. I think those two coaches work together. So they've committed someone here. They've got someone in the seam here and two cross court people. Here's Manitoba. They've committed to line blocking all the time. They've got someone here for the tip. They're going to force you cross court. They've still got someone here in middle middle. This is Mount Royal. Pretty similar. Two people here, and they're blocking line. So that's a different, little bit of a difference. This is UBCO. We just played them this weekend. Pretty similar. That's kind of what we've seen before. This is us. You can kind of see where we've got someone line. We've got someone middle, middle, someone cross court. If I'm picky, I don't really like where this person's standing. I'll show you why I'd like her a little bit over here. But here's one of the things that I. Every time I try to move someone out of middle middle, someone scores. I just sit there and I see. And so I've done a couple other studies. For example, defending the 31. OK, so you've got two blockers. They close it. You'd think this is the alley that they should hit. 
But when I did my study, what I found is 50% went here, 50% went to middle-middle. So we have to decide, do we slide or do we stay on that? The other study that I wanted to do was, where do we position people down the line? And these are the studies that I would just encourage you to do. And when I did my study over of a season of attacking, of everybody hitting down the line, this is what I found. What I found is 1 in 10 went right down the line. And the remainder were just inside the line. And so what that told me was, hmm, maybe I can position myself a little bit off the line. So we tried to give ourselves about a foot. So we're not right on the line. We're a little bit inside. And that we're still going to be able to get that ball down this way. But we can still get a lot of balls that are going to hit just inside the line. Because I want to position my players where most of the ball goes and be able to position myself quite well. Feel free to ask questions anytime here. I'm just going to walk through some positioning. A um, couple more things. So that was a left side of the attack. Here we've got some, if I was to look at some, some right side, that's pretty important. Here we've got UBC again. You can see their positioning. Someone line, someone middle, middle here. My guess is these two people are going to compete for that ball that gets tipped. Here's Saskatchewan. Okay, pretty much similar. Got Alberta. They've got someone fully committed here to score. If I've got to push this ball deep, I bet you she's going to chase it down. So it's tough. When you fully commit someone to a tip, especially at the younger level, I don't think it's a bad idea. And you have to decide. If that's where most of the balls go, put someone right there. This is where we're going to stand. And then figure out if they tend to score, then you can adjust a little bit from there. Here's Calgary. Okay, Something fairly similar. Again, they slide this way. Regina. A okay. little bit more. And then, oh, this is us. There we go. So I've got someone down line here. I've got someone here. So for our systems, we want to make sure that we're a tip away or a pancake away from pretty much anything. Now, if someone could just help me quickly, I'm just going to move this here just so I can go onto the court. Would someone mind grabbing that screen for me? Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Alex. Could I have six volunteers to stand on the court with me? That would be very wonderful. Come on this side, if you don't mind. Yep. So I did my level three, and I didn't know Brian Newman was going to be here, but Brian Newman is here. When I did my level three, he came in and evaluated me. And at that time, we sat in his office, and he said, Ryan, what are your start positions? And I said, well, these are our start positions. And he looked at me and he said, well, if I'm watching your practice, I couldn't tell where your start positions were. Like, oh, here I am, a CIS team, we're practicing, and I don't even have people where he can tell where our start positions are. And so I just need three people at the net, three people in the back row. And so you have to decide, based on your game, where you want to start your players. And my suggestion would be is get very good at it. Be picky, be even anal about where you start and why you start there. So in our systems, if we have a backcourt setter, we are going to make sure that we're right here. You can call it 10 by 10. We're basically a big step in and a step and a half back. I'm going to have the same thing right here. Back up a little bit. Perfect. And now, I'm picky about middle-middle because I see so many balls. And when I say middle-middle, it's the middle of that red line and that red line. So find the middle. Find the middle of that red line and that red line. That's pretty good. Okay. <laughs> So we've got three people at the net. Very nice. Okay. So this would be my start position based on a backcourt setter on that way. Why would a front court setter change my positioning on this side? They could dump. So what we can do is depending on that setter, if I know that setter likes to dump, we'll just kind of bring this person in and we'll start here. I might even bring that person in anyway. They'll be chirping at them just a little bit. 
not trash talking, just saying, hey, if you're going to dump the ball, I'm standing right here and I'm going to pick it up. Does that influence some setters? Yes. Does that some, sometimes negatively, and sometimes they just go off on you. Depends on their personality. So you decide how you want to poke that personality. So this is where they'll start. Soon as if the setter sets off the net, they're going to back, or so it passes off the net, they're backed up. We like to bunch, so we're fairly close together. And if you'll notice on that video, I didn't point it out, some teams are spread, some teams are a little bit more bunched. I like bunching because I believe we want to get as much, many hands on the ball as we can. Now you have to find the risk versus the reward of that. And I would say in most cases, you're going to want to get at least four hands on the ball. If you're coaching 18 U men's, you might want to be triple blocking every single one. Every, if you can, can get triple on the left side, you can go ahead and do that. One of the reasons why I don't triple as much as on the collegiate level is because if we bring all people over here, we're blocking the left side, if we dig it up, who can we set now? I better have a darn good pipe attack. This person right side, if she's a setter, we can't set her, but if she's a right side, we might be able to set her. It then becomes predictable. And in the women's game, the pipe is getting better, but it's not what it is in the men's game. In the men's game, you can triple, they can dig this ball up, and that guy's screaming, or that guy is going to wail on a ball. And so the options are a little better. So you're coaching men's, I would say, that might be a good option for you. Women's, so-so. Maybe you've got a gifted and a freaky hitter, then you might want to do it. So that's our situation. So this is our start position. And you can be really picky about this. When you're coaching and you're putting balls over, you're yipping at these people. Where are they standing? Why are they standing? When we warm up, I warm up using just doing this instead of running in circles. Can I have those balls, Chris? Thank you. My girls get in partners. If you've just got one court, you could have a couple different partners. But let's say you and I are partners. I'm picky. I'd like your toes pointed at the middle. Why do I want his toes at the middle? Because that's where the first attack's coming from. So some people like to be outside. I like to be in and just in the spot where I think most of the balls go. So in my charts, most, a lot of 51s come here. Some players like to cut back, so they're going to be here like this. And so, if I'm just warming up, I've got a whole list of things that I like my athletes to do. So they come in the gym for the 15, first 15 minutes, I don't have to do a thing. They just come in and they go through their list. One of them is defensive routines. And so you're going to start there. When I toss, I just want you to drop and hop. You're going to drop with this outside foot and then hop back. Beautiful. Nice. Do that again. <laughs> Toes at the middle. Okay, here we go. Nice. And so we're partners and I, I'll, I'll go chase that down. And I'll just keep doing that again, and I might just work on different stuff. Sorry, that was really mean. And so I'll just be working on different skills with them. Now I'm going to make you overhead dig. And so it's just getting warmed up. But they're on each other. They're making sure their positioning is perfect. And so that because there's no real variables, some things you can do perfectly. Start position is one of them. And I would encourage you to be picky with that. There's a sense of discipline when they get good at it. You'll see it, the positioning really matters. Okay, if we're going to defend a left side ball, thank you, I'll take that, we're going to push you two guys over. Our base position is a wrap. So if you could just be a blocker for a second. If, that, if I'm that person over there, I'm just going to wrap my hands around the ball. Where am I? I'm just going to put my blocker like this. And so if I'm going to line block, I'm going to, or a lacrosse block, I'm going to be over. If I'm going to be a line block, I'm a little bit over this way. But a base position here, we'll say, is a wrap block, which means you're going to leave a little bit of line. Okay? You're going to give me a drop and a hop here. Nice. You're going to stay in middle, middle for me. Find middle, middle. And all you're going to do is turn. It's like there's a, something that goes right through your body. You're just going to turn. Perfect. Hands down just a little bit. There you go. Okay? I like this person to bring and put the right foot on this red line. Okay? You are going to basically take a look. And this is where become readings become so important. The sequence is ball, for the backcourt players, it's ball setter, ball hitter. So the first one, ball. Is it coming over? Blockers are a part of that. The answer is no. They take a quick look at the setter. Sometimes if it's a setter, it's a front row setter, they'll take a longer look because they want to know if they're going to dump. If it's a back row setter, it's just a glance and then they're gone. 
And they're finding ball, which is really fast, and then they're getting a good look at this hitter. And the information that they're trying to get, the position five person, is can I hit you? If I'm hunting like this, can you hit me? Can I hit you? Yeah, and so you stay right there. If I'm hunting like this, I want you to slide. And you're going to slide right to that corner there. You're going to protect that corner. So I might, very rare that I do this. So you're going to protect that corner. Guess what you're going to do? You're going to do nothing. <laughs> you're going to stay right there. You're just going to turn. That is our base position. Now, based on tendencies, I don't have a problem moving that person if I know that this attacker really likes to go there. But I find every time I take someone out of middle-middle, someone scores. And I can't yell at my athletes because I've decided to move them. And so it's just what we do. Okay, my line defender drops and hops. He's there and he's ready to do this. Okay, now we can change this up depending on whether or not our opponent can hit the line. If my opponent can't hit the line, and let's say they tip a lot, what could we do? I'd move you up. So we call it high line. We're gonna, this is our start position, all we're gonna do is right here. For some of my athletes, high line is closer than others. High line means whatever they do, they can't score a tip on you. And so I've got some that are a little bit slower, and so their high line is right here. Some that's not so fast, they're a little bit back here. But I don't want their heads taken off, so at times you might say, hey, just need to block the line, protect them, let them know. <laughs> I might say, hey, even if they're a bad defender, going, hey, we're playing high line today, and then front, we're block line, and so they don't get hit. And so that is our base position for blocking the left side ball. And you can move this person up. This person you can move in and out. Sometimes this person will creep in. The deciding factor of who gets the tip balls, I found, is the direction of the tip. If I tip this way, it's that person. If I'm going to tip, if the movement comes this way, it's typically the left side player. And so it's the, the direction of the tip decides who is responsible for that ball. If it's in the middle, hopefully I've got two people kind of pancaking it for it. Some coaches hate pancakes. They think it's lazy. I think I love them. I think it's cleaner. I think a pancake is way cleaner than a player rushing in and trying to do this at a ball that they don't know where it's going to go. And so a nice clean pancake, I know that that's up. Hope I didn't break the microphone. And someone else can come underneath it, put it high, and then we can get a swing on it. So you decide whether or not you think it's lazy or not. I personally like it. Okay. Let's come back to our base positions here. Very nice. Okay. Typically, if I'm picking my, you put out your fingers, hands, you touch your elbow. There we go. And you're going to touch your fingertips. Okay. So this is a pretty tight bunch. If I'm coaching at some other levels, I'm going to make my bunch a younger level. I might push it out just a little bit to help it out. At a guy's level, that's my bunch at every level. And so I want to get as many hands as I can on the ball. Okay? If they're running a 51, you two are on it. You're digging stuff that comes through. You've got tip over. If I'm a setter and I'm going to come here and they've got this bunch, you can move right up and you can guard that ball right there. And you can be on that. I find that person should stay there. Why? Because balls seem to go there. But you check your level. You stat it. You throw up a camera. I can't emphasize the value of throwing up a camera and just taping it and just sitting there with a pen or just walking into a gym and seeing your level. Walk to any court on your level and just start charting where balls go. And do that for when in between times and in between games, and I'd say the benefit will be well worth it. If I'm running a 31 here, these two people are going to come here. Sometimes you can slide. You can take that. We call it a two-step. And I'm just going to move. And I'm just going to kind of breathe at that ball. Where you're going to prevent me from hitting the sideline, and I'm going to hopefully, there might be a little gap here. There we go. You're going to get that hard-driven ball. You might be getting one rolls off the hand, but it's going to come in that general direction. I'm amazed at how many players just hit straight ahead too. Even at my level. They just hit straight ahead, ball rolls over, away they go. Okay, right side, if I'm pulling over this way. You've done a nice drop and hop for me. What do we do with you? Well, one of the things I charted is that this area of the court 
hardly any balls go. So I'm going to completely give it up. If they hit the shot, it's theirs. And so we are going to put you right about here. And he is the one player that I allow moving on contact. Because a lot of times, they're here, they might be coming out, the ball's fast, a 73 or a back set's faster than the left side, so they don't have much time. And so if they're coming here, and they're moving slowly on contact, I'm okay with that. For you, I want you nice and stopped. What are you doing? Just staying here. You're exactly. Okay, you're here, and I don't mind a little bit of movement up here, just to cut off something. But that's a positioning that's going to be okay. And then based on some tendencies, if I know they've got a sharp shot, I might slide you a little bit more that way. And if they don't, unless they like doing this seam, I might pull you over a two-step. But I'm not two-stepping any further from middle-middle. It's never more than a two-step. And I find my teams dig a lot of balls. And we have one of the highest defensive stats in the league every year. My libero that I had six years ago, she retired, sorry, she graduated four or five years ago, she still holds the Canada rest record. And I put her in middle-middle, and she holds it. He, she still has it. She just sit there and wait for the ball. And she just had an ability to get the perfect angle, the perfect platform, and she was good at it. Okay, come back to the middle then. Yes? Yeah, sorry, go back to there again. He's got to make sure he's low. At first I thought, oh, are they gonna, what are they going to do? Any balls that get hard driven, you know you just leave them. They just go right over your head. He's only responsible for tips. And they've got to have the discipline not to reach up. Yes. I, you can come all the way this far to dig a tip. We change it a little bit. So my base position is this. If this attacker does not have a very good line shot, what I will do is say, I'm going to give you the line. You're going to come here. And you would think at my level, everybody can hit every shot. But they don't. Even at the CIS level, this shot is sometimes a really hard shot to make for a right side player. So I'll just bring you up. Sometimes, yes. But some, some lefties still don't hit it. It depends completely on the athlete. I'll bring you up. I'll just position you right there. And we'll just have this position. This is a lot of times my base attack for a step attack. Because most step hitters in the women's game, they come in and they torque at cross court. That's their motion. They have a hard time doing this motion. So we're not going to leave that much line. Come here a little bit. Just, that's a little scary. <laughs> and so typically it's a wrap. If the ball's here, you're coming up there. Two of you, I've got two people then on tips because I know they can't hit this shot. At least I tell my athletes that, and then if something happens during the game, go, oh, okay, that's not what I saw, and then we make a change. But athletes are typically pretty smart, and I like what uh, Cecile said there about making your athletes scout them out. And I've heard stories of coaches coming in with game plans and going, this is what we're going to do, and the athletes go, uh, that's not what they do. And they can fight about it, and then some, most of the time the athletes are right, because they're the ones out there. And a, I find a lot of teams are different against my team than other teams. And I would say most coaches would say the same. Just because our block might be different, we might get more hands on you. But the biggest thing is, that what I hate the most, is when players say, well, I thought, and this is why I did that. So my system tries to eliminate I thought, because it's a great excuse. Well, why did you, you missed a dig. Well, you know what, I thought she was going to tip, and she didn't, she hit it. So then I can challenge them and say, okay, what are you looking at? What are you reading? I just don't allow I thought, I don't allow guessing in my gym, I hate charging. And right now, I've got three girls on my team that just like to charge the ball. So get back to a base position for me. They think that this charge, and I've got a very good libero, but she likes to jump. She'll jump forward and she'll get to this spot. I'm like, what are you trying to dig? You have just eliminated a meter of opportunity. The person's just hit a 51 at you right at your head area. What are your chances of digging that ball? If I hit this ball at you hard right now, do you want to be there, or do you want to be a meter back digging it? Exactly. <laughs> and so I tried to eliminate all charging in my gym. Just be calm, wait. Wait, watch, and react is a term that I use often. Not wait, guess, and then go after the ball. Wait, watch, and then react, and then go from there. Is that what you want? 
it's okay. Typically, they're going to get here, and they actually might even get a little bit closer because they're digging that. And they know, I've trained them not to do this. And I've yet, in 13 years, to have an athlete go throw up the hands and hit the ball. It hasn't happened yet. So maybe I'm lucky. That's the, hey, uh, that's the beauty. If you don't like this, you say, hey, you're in her way, you go right there. That's where I want you to be because I don't want you in her way. What I find is she, this person's usually pretty moving and they're low. And that's just something to play around with in your gym and see where those balls go. It doesn't matter, yes, right side or setter. Well, if the ball gets dug up and they happen to be right here, hopefully it's dug up to the middle of the court and they just have to do this and then they can make some choices from there. Does that answer your question? Uh, well, if you're playing a six, do you have the back row set at the tip? That's, right. yes. So. Or if you're running a six, two, it's perfect. <laughs> they run this person, you're standing right there, you can, yeah. you can take that ball. Oh. In my system, if my setter takes the ball, my libero is taking every second ball. She is a complete bully. If you touch her second ball, she will be all over you. And it kind of just happened naturally. I saw internationally it was going to that, and all of a sudden she just jumped on it, and she just went screaming all over the place, and you, no one touches her second ball unless it's really, really close to them. Absolutely, yeah, for sure. You want your best ball control. If that happens to be your right side, that's great. If that happens to be your middle back or someone else, you have your best ball control people touching those second and third, second and third ball. You uh, mentioned you had your libero in the mid to front of the stick. Is that always happening? I flip flopped. Because it's such a high volume area, I want a good defender there. If I can get a left side player who can run the pipe and be a good defender, that's the best of both worlds. And so I've got one left side who's a great defender and we keep her there. I've got one left side who's my best pipe hitter though, but she's a very weak defender. We had to move her out and just say, hey, all you do is dig hard driven balls and she runs her pipe a little bit differently. And so. I would want a hitter in six back. And so with that, if I happened, and we sometimes blew, I've got one girl on my team, she loves to blue, so I just let her do it. And so we come over here, she screams blue, 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 everybody in the gym knows, you're screaming blue, blue, blue. You know you get right to the line. You get right to the line, you're coming, you're coming, you pull up, you're digging off speed, you stay middle, middle, and you're watching for tips that come here and anything that squeezes through. It's kind of a bit of a gamble. I haven't studied it as much, so I'm not, this is one study I might do this next summer here. Sorry, blue means we're going to triple block. Sorry. That's just this code in our name. So that far person knows that they have to get right to the line to block the ball. Okay? So if I'm training this, if I'm putting this in place now, so you pick your systems, you do your study, but I want to give you some drills that I think that would be, would be helpful. So I've got one drill that uh, doesn't use motor learning principles. John Kessel would very much disagree with it <laughs> because it involves the coach standing and just tossing balls. But what I found that I've gotten from it is I get work ethic from my girls. I get a sense of hustle, a sense of pursuit. There is a sense, a little bit of reading. I get to work technically. I get to work on positioning. And they walk out of the gym and they've, they've worked hard. And it also sets the tone for practice. And I do it almost every day or every second day just to kind of set the tone. And so is there three people that don't mind working hard? OK, three people out here. And so we call it three man D touch 10. It's not meant to be punishment. It's just meant to work hard. OK, so I'll have three people out. OK, perfect. And I'll get them in their start positions. 
And what you're trying to do is you're just chasing balls down, and I'm not going to do it for very long. I'll be kind of nice. But they need to also work on their second ball setting. So I'm creating a little bit of stress, and they're making sure that their second ball setting good. I had the national team coach, the men's team, come up to me once and goes, how much time do you spend setting second balls? And I kind of thought for a little bit, I'm like, not that much. And he's like, that might be something you might want to look at. And so since that day, and that was about six years ago, we spend a lot of time, everybody knowing, knowing how to set a good second ball. Because the more we get swings, the better we're going to be. Now here's my also belief when it comes to defense. And I wrestle with an assistant coach who was a football player. He's like, defense wins championships. I'm like, no, offense does. And so we'd fight and we'd debate about it. Defense for sure is vital. But if I'm going to put my components of where I'm going to be spending my time, I'm weighting it towards offense. Because defense and blocking is completely a reactionary sport. Right now, my team is leading the league in blocks. We're setting a new record. But I'm going, I'm limited by what a hitter does. I can't say, let's go out and get 20 blocks today. I have no idea, walking into a game, how many points that I'm going to get. But I know that if I spend some time on offense, we have way more control of the shots that we're going to make, where we're going to hit the ball, and how we're going to score points. And so I'm not saying blocking and defense aren't important, but I weight them below offensive training. So if you're periodizing and you're planning out your system, offensive training, working with your setters, working on attacking shots comes before and always in correlation. So this is a drill that I use here just to get things going. One of you has to get it up. The other one has to make a nice second ball set. And we do 10 in our gym. And so I could be as easy as this. There we go. Someone else is going to get it. Oh, hey, you're going. Here we go. Be ready. Here we go. Ball here. Nice. OK, set it up again. Set it up. Face positions. Here we go. Here we go. Ball here. Here we go. Ball there. Nice touch. Here we go. Right here. Right here. I need someone to get a pancake. There we go. So I'm making them move around. It's pretty quick. I, walked, I like walking into someone's gym and I saw someone doing touch 10. I said, can I put this on steroids a little bit? He said, yeah, sure. Come on in. And so I'll just kind of beef it up so they're working on, just they're working hard, working on their second ball touches. I don't do this for a long period of time, but I do it just a little bit to set the tone. A couple other drills that I like doing is I like to have three people working on defense, and I like to do small games because I like to get lots of touches in. And you'll see the drill. It's called Neville's Wash. And we do it in, we can do it three on three. We can do it six on three. We can do it six on six. And we do it a variety of different ways. So I'll have three people working on defense. I'll have a full six over there, and they're cycling. I'll roll bowl the ball in. I'll bowl 10 balls in. And they have to get on this side a certain amount, or they're trying to get a certain amount of points. How many points that can they get on 10 balls? And they get a point for every dig, and they get a point for every rally they win. So we're still playing a really live game here, but they could get up to five points a rally if they keep digging it up. And so the emphasis on defense, I'm standing here, I'm coaching them, I'm talking to them about their base position. There's no blockers, so it's hard. The mandate that I have for my attackers is you have to attack deep. If you slam it straight down, it's a wash. We redo that ball. So they're working on attacking deep. They're working on reading. They're working on good eye work. I'm watching their eyes. What are you looking at? Why are you doing what you're doing based on what you see? And so they'll just be hitting balls in, and they'll just be reacting to it. Then I'll go six on six. I love to do this six on six. My other team is in system the entire time. I'll sometimes change it so half the balls are in system where they're nicely at the net. Half of them are out of system. I was talking with a coach once, and I said, well, you're working on defense. What did you do to get better? Because I heard you needed to become a better defensive team. He said, we started serving tougher. And it was, it was that simple. We needed to serve tougher to keep our opponent off of the net so it made us a better defensive team. If you can keep your opponents out of system, you become more predictable in what's going to happen. Another, another drill that I love to do that, if I could have um, three more people out here, please. Maybe the other three that were working here before. I do this 12 on, or 6 on 6. I call it, you can go 10 man D, 12 man D. Sometimes if my middles need a break, you've only got a couple, they can get gassed pretty quick. I'll have another 6 over there. And I'll just be initiating a ball. So I'll say, OK, we're learning our positions. I've given them all the keywords. 
I'll be standing here and I'm mimicking a ball that's being hit here. So come on over here, slide over. Okay, you need to know where you stand right there. You need to go there. I'll hit this ball, play it out now. And then they play it out. Okay, come back here again. If they miss it, I give them another shot. And if they don't get it after that next time, then typically I'll give the other team a point. So here we go, ball here. Here we go. Oops, sorry. So they hit it over, there's a next, another six over there, and then I hit at the losing team. If this team lost again here, I'll be here again, ball here, here we go. I guess we didn't decide who our setters were. Who's my setter? Are you my setter? And so I'll go all over the place, I'll go over here, the losing side gets it, and so I'm really working on their positioning, I'm here, come over here, right here, okay, come, perfect, back up just a little bit, back up. Okay, I'll make sure I have it set up the way I want. Okay, now go back to the beginning. You guys can just stay here. Okay, ready? I'm going to toss the ball. Here we go. Ball here. And they'll play it out. I find it saves a little bit with jumps if I initiate it. I don't see it being a bad thing that the coach initiates the odd ball here and there. Say it again. I'm a front and back switcher. So we'll play to eight. We'll switch front and back so that people do it this way. I also do, if I'm doing games, and you'll see the other ones here, um, there's rotations. I rarely ever rotate in a normal one, six, five, four, three, two, one. I'm always going one to four. So we'll work in rotation one, and then we'll flip to rotation four, and it flips my middles. If you're in a drill and your middles here and they get really gassed, then you rotate one, and they're doing the same thing over again. They get gassed, they rotate one, they can be really exhausted. So if we're flipping, we're typically flipping front and back each time, and we need to work in rotations more. The more gyms that I go in, I, see I rarely see club coaches working by rotation, and I would encourage you, figure out your rotations. Where do people stand? Okay, this is where we're standing. We're working in this rotation now, and then we're gonna go 10 balls here, and then we're gonna flip to rotation four, 10 balls this way. You can always be working with your defense at the same time. Okay, what else have I got here? We've got some routines, we've got a little touch 10. We've got different digging reps. And so one of the drills, I'll put three people out here. If you could come on this side a little bit. What I'll do is, just if I want to get some touches, I'm working on my offensive pattern. So I've got a coach here, and they're just spinning into a libero, and I've got a setter setting either side. And so they're setting either side, they attack a ball. This person, this, one of them digs it up, and I've just got a coach here, and they'll just toss it. And they'll hit at the other person, while another ball is going in. So it gets us another quick extra rep, and then overall it gets a couple more touches in on the course of a drill. Well, I like to go by time, so we're gonna go one minute with this group, just a lot of digging touches, and then we'll flip. Another group, this group will flip in, and we're constantly rotating. Any questions? So if this gentleman here has just hit a ball, and they've, let's say the middle middle's dug it up, Soon as the ball is landed, I'm going to hit a ball at another person. And he's going to dig that ball, and just as it's ending, I've got my coach here, or my player, throwing in a ball. So it kind of happens in between the rally. So a ball gets hit by that side, they've dug it up, coach hits another ball, and then another ball gets entered that gets hit again. That's right. That's right. So if I have a setter here, can I have anybody volunteer to come and set? Your setter, perfect. Your hitter. Head on over there, perfect. You can, you can hit two. Get the balls out of the way. So it would look like this. Can you pass? Okay, perfect. Here we go. So let's say I've got three attackers working right now. Okay, we've got a passer here. Here we go, let's try it again, that's all right. Here we go, ball here. Here we go. Now. If, I, if that ball came from this side, I might want to be over here. Let's say you dug it. I'm going here. They've just dug it up. Perfect. Ball gets entered. I usually don't have a second person playing it out. I might have a target. Ball goes over. Ball here. There we go. It just, just gets things going a little bit more. Any other questions? I'm just trying to think through positioning here a little bit. If all three of you could come on this side. 
You have to decide how you're also going to defend back row balls. And I think it's different. The ladies' game is different than the men's game. The men's game, you're trying to block it. You're trying to get up at it. On the CIS women's game, there are probably four attackers in the league that I will block. The remainder, I actually had my girls, we were blocking all of them. And my girls come up to say, Ryan, that's not blocking. I go, come on, are you kidding me? I said, no, we're good enough. We are going to dig everything. I'm like, okay. And so what we did is we just stayed down, and they proved me wrong. They went up there, person would hit, they would read it, they dug it up. Our girls were in transition, and we just wailed on it right back at them. And it was really good for us. It built our confidence. We play a lot of backcourt threes. I think backcourt threes is a great game for just a lot of defensive reps early in a game. We start our practice with ball control. Every practice, we are doing some form of team ball control where we're trying to get a certain amount in a row. And it could be backcourt threes or a game that we call cross-court down ball where they're just cycling and they're rotating. And they have to get 25 in a row over the net before the drill stops. And I'm willing to go an hour, an hour and a half on this if I'm, if I'm in the right mood to get it done. And we have records of somewhere to between, I think our highest record is 69 of balls over the net with people just going half speed balls. They get girls get into a rhythm. And so there's general ball control that I think you need to do as individuals. And there's also team ball control. And team ball control, a lot of defenses involved it, controlling the dig, getting it up, good second ball setting, controlled attacking so they know where it is. I believe that if you can attack a ball slowly with control, it's easier to hit a ball harder with control. And so I have one of my girls who's managing some shoulders, and it was an experiment this week. This week, all you're doing is half-speed shots. And we're gonna, we were going to see this weekend, was it going to affect her control? Because we're nervous. I didn't, because we have to fan, manage it for another month. And so that's what we did. We managed it, and she went into this weekend, and she had a really good weekend. So that tells me I can, I can do that a little bit more. Any other questions? Oh, thank you. I didn't finish that. Ha. If, if we have our base start position, show us our start positions. As soon as they know it's a backcourt, they flatten out. You're going to stay there, you're going to back up, you're going to back up here, and we're going to be ready. UBCO this weekend, in charting their back row attacks, they really like to hit to one. And so I had this person ready, and I had this person was told, hey, get ready to two-step to your left if they're running a back row attack, or just be ready to move there. If they can anticipate it, they're going to have a better chance of getting it to it. And so that was something that we did. But getting nice and flat, I think, is the key. If you've got people blocking here, if you've got three, two, typically if I'm blocking someone in the female league, I'm going to try to get two people on them, and this person's going to cover the tip. And they're going to somehow get in here. Because we put all three, this is pretty dangerous here, I would tip every time. Even from a backcourt attack, if you want to score or teach your backcourts how to score, this ball right there scores 60% of the time. I'm amazed at how much it scores. I was to the point where I'm like, let's run it as a play all the time. It all depends on the attacker. If they're a good attacker, we're going to put four hands on them, two bodies, and it depends a little bit. If that pipe is a little bit more this way, those two people are there, you've got it. If they're running it a little bit more this side, we've got two people there, you've got it. So it little, depends a little bit on where it's being run as to who's going to be getting that ball. And if they're not blocking, if they're, not blocking they're, they're getting off and they're ready. They're, so let's say you're my setter. You're going to stay at the net. The two of them are going to back up and get ready. They're not going to dig anything with their hands. They're just watching for off speed. My assistant coach is on me this year. He says, they're just getting in the way. Keep them at the net. Let them block. Let's not have them in the way. But what I don't like is I hate giving up easy points. Because they'll attack, they'll hit our hands, and all of a sudden they got the point where my back row's going, I want to dig that ball, just give it to me. And so that's kind of the wrestle. That's the risk versus reward. But if I'm playing a top CIS team who has some girls who can kick on that ball, I've got to get hands up or I'm in trouble. Okay, so if you're saying in CIS there's only four hitters that you would block. Yep. At club level there are zero hitters that you would block. Yes. Okay. I'm, well.
that's my level, but it's relative. Maybe in your level, you might be, have one or two girls who could really swing on it, but they still swing hard enough to score. My defenders are such where they can't score on a majority. So you would measure that. I would probably be very slow to triple block or even double block at the club level. I think we don't have a lot being run. Now, guys' level might be different, but that's girls' level. Over on the left side, if I was playing U yeah. U15, I would have middle and left side blocking. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so normal. What do you do when it's just yeah, just normal then? Okay, if this middle is pretty, that's what I'm not sure. About. Okay, so set up our bunch here. Check out your distance. Middle, put out their hands, fingertips, your elbows. There we go. You can decide how you want to set it up. I like the bunch because it puts. And in CIS, there's only maybe two or three CIS schools that are running a fairly tight bunch to get four hands on every middle attack. So I like it because if they want to run a 51, you two are all over it. Okay, spread it apart. If I'm running a 31, you two are all over that. In your level, maybe you're getting some 53s. Okay, I would have four hands on that ball. I would maybe put this person to watch for tips. But if you're running little high balls in the middle, I'm going to get four hands on you. That's my personal. The disadvantage, anybody know the disadvantage of running a bunch? That's OK. Combinations are still good. It happens if, when they set to the wings. How fast can you get out here in order to block that ball? How fast can you get out there in order? So set it up. And so we've become. We've tried to become very, very good at knowing when someone's in my zone. So if I'm running a 31 here, am I in his zone? You go. And you figure out whatever what different movement patterns. For us, we like to swing. If you want a quick three to get out there, he's gone. If I'm hitting here, set it up. If I'm running here and I'm in system, you're gone. And so now remember, I would say 50% of the time, teams are going to be in system, a lot of times they're not. So as soon as a team is out of system, both of you, you're gone. And because we can, unless we're running some high ball in the middle, then we can stay in tight. And so if there's no one in your zone, you go. OK, sorry, set up your, set up your, get the right spacing. I'm real picky on my spacing, check it out. No, no, elbow. You're too tight. There we go. OK, so if that's my spacing. Sorry, what was the question? That's right. Because I'm attacking a 51 on this part of the court, he's not going to help. So if they set it outside, he's ready. If they attack here and they do this, hopefully he's going to come around and get that ball. He's usually, excuse me for a second, yeah, no. I'm going to move you. Yeah. Go if he's going, his movement is like this. So he's moving but still watching very closely. It's not a gamble. I rarely get burned on tips. So they have to, it's what they're looking at. They're here, they're still watching the setter, but they're moving and if they see some sort of tip, and in our league, middles aren't tipping very much right now. If your league might be different. Well, they also have to tip over the block, right? So you could have that time. Yeah. That's right. That's the factor. So if they have to get it over, hopefully you've got someone there. And depending on where the setter is, this person can always come up a little bit as well. If those two have a tight block together, and there's no one here, and it's a front row setter, this guy can come up a little bit. And if he's fast enough, he'll have quick enough to get back there. So you can play around with that a little bit. Yes. Set that up. Who, passes? Who passes in serve receive? I always have left side player. So if you're my setter, you're my, no, you're my setter right now. You go back there. You're my right side. Come on over here. I've got, so depending on how you want to set up your teams, I always have my middles leading my setter. So this is always my middle. You can be my middle. So these two are my middles right here, and these two are my left sides right here. Okay, so let's put you at the net here. 
So if I'm in position one here, I'm going to bring you back here and pass. Okay. You're going to get libeled out, or you could be a middle. You're a middle here, so we're going to bring you back here. Okay. You're right side, so we can decide. If my, I like to have my right sides pass, depending on their ability. I can keep them here. I can just go three people across. What part of this did you want to see? What setup part component? Okay. I like three passers. I also like four passers. So I do a three or a four passer system. The four passers, just to kind of be a little bit deceptive, you put four people there and the server kind of looks, go, where am I serving? There's no seams out there. But that person there can't pass. I hope they don't serve over there. But they're doing it to be deceptive. In this case, though, we're going to bring you back here. I like to have my middles off the net. The reason I do that is statistics tell me that I can get more kills from a four-step approach versus a three-step approach. So I keep my middles off the net. You need to be on this side right there. So we've got one person there, one person there, one person there. To me, that's not too confusing. It's a little bit busy over here, but as soon as contact happens, he's gone. So he's nowhere to be found. She, I now give the responsibility of my middles to pass short balls. So they feel more involved in it. They're not just a middle attacker. They're standing here going, hey, you sure have short. I'm going to pass the ball. I'm going to protect this person so they can just swing. They don't have to try to do this, this, and then this again. So I have my middle serve receive in every rotation, whether they're here or over there. Is that question being answered? <laughs> but uh, where are you asked your players to place hands as, yeah. as far as the general rule to have them? For sure. Space yeah, I shouldn't say I don't spend a lot of time. I spend more time. So this is the general lineup that we have. So blockers at the net. If the attack is coming from here, they know we're either wrap blocking, we're line blocking, or we're cross blocking. 80% of the time we're wrap blocking. That means... You, as a right side player, are putting your hands around this ball. Wherever it's going to land, wherever that attacker is going to make contact, you're going to make sure that you have your hands wrapped around that ball. Okay? If we're line blocking, you're going to have your left hand on that ball. If we're cross blocking, sorry, sorry, that's cross blocking. No, that's line blocking, sorry. Line blocking. Cross blocking, you're putting your, that hand on the ball. Does that answer your question? Yeah. That's right. Their job is to get there and try to close. That's right. Outsides are setting it up, middles are closing. Going up, are they coming up spread and then closing it all over, or is it pretty simple just to wrap? Yeah. I like to have my fingertips up. I know I was taught to block like this, but what I found is we're looking for positive touches and having our hands here. These fingers make a better positive touch. So I'm going up, shoulder width up, and I'm pressing. This middle, if they're coming late, the rule is they're only allowed to reach as long as they're over the net. So they're coming in fast, they're screaming late, they can come here, and they're pressing, and as, as they're pressing, they can do this, but they still have to be over the net. As Soon as they do this, we're now hands in a late middle blocker, and my girls are trained. You know we're in system, that middle blocker is likely to be late, you go right off her arms and we're trying to redirect the ball as much as possible. This is a skill that I would encourage all of you to teach your attackers, and I don't think we do it enough. And I've invested more time in the last probably three years than I have my entire 13 of teaching my girls or my boys, my 14U, 15U boys now, how to use the block, how to see the block. And so we spend time recycling, hitting into the block so they can get the ball back. If we don't have a good attack, why give it to them? Let's get another attack out of it. I'm going to hit into your hands lightly. I'm going to play the ball up. Our setter's going to come. And now we're going to even get a better attack at it because the set might not be there. And so if I don't have a good attack, how well can I attack this side of his hand? Coming down line. Bang, hit it here. Oh, that's the best. What is the best kill in the game? 
It's the easiest because there's no defender standing over there. So I'm just going to go here and off that side. And so it's just a great way to get free points. And I'm at the point now, I don't care how I get a point anymore. <laughs> My big middle hit a 61 yesterday. That's the biggest hit that I've seen in a while. She came up and she buried the 61 right on the attack line and just popped it up. And I had guys in the gym going, whoa, that's a big hit. But it's just as good as my little shrew of a left side hitter that comes in and goes, chip, and gets the point. It's one point. Yeah. Any other questions? How are we doing for time? I haven't looked at the time. Okay. That's about it then. You're welcome. Thank you. Passing, I like to have them here. Because what I found, the first movement is their hands come quickly together. I want them together as quick as they can so they can find angles. If you think about like the ball is coming to my side, I just move there like really fast. Isn't it easier to connect or is it easier to swing? I did another study. And if you watch international athletes, and I taught defense like that for years. It's almost like for your game, you're playing man's game where they're serve receiving, they're pounding balls. That's right. But what they found is when they looked at all these high level athletes, they always did this and then this. And we're like, come on, come on. We got to teach them how to do this. But there's some sort of reaction in us that just gets our hands together, even at the highest level. So, Ideally, I think that is a better move. There's something biomechanically that we struggle to do it. So, uh, yes and no. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.